Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Hello friends and listeners and welcome to a new episode number 18 of our season 7 of the Thoughts Hermy podcast. And before we start, happy new year. Yes, it's January the 2nd, 2022. We have made it. We've gone past 2021. And let's just hope that 2022, even though it starts a bit tricky again, will be in the end a better year than 2021 it wasn't so bad but for many it was bad and i do hope that all of you here today um have had at least a nice and reposing holiday season if you had one and um well welcome back to the source Hermes podcast in this new year with new exciting episodes well, we continue episodes in season seven, of course, for the moment, um, but the year is new and I will try to present you again a bunch of really nice and interesting interviews. So, um, glad to have you back, uh, glad to have you here for the first time, if this is your first with the Thoughts Hermes podcast. In both cases, do not forget to go to our website, thoshermes.com, T-H-O-T-H-E-R-M-E-S.com. You will find plenty, plenty of information on each episode there. And as we have had now, well, well over 100 guests um, that had interesting things to say here, you'll find links to their websites, you'll find more information about them and more information about the topics we were discussing. So it's really become a nice uh, an, a nice source of information for all of you right and while you are at the website why not sending me some feedback you know i like feedback i tell you each week and each week i get a little can send you more can send me more just do it uh, either you use the commentary buttons also on youtube of course i never mentioned that but of course that's also a way to send me messages and you do, actually. People do that. Um, but there is Twitter, there is Facebook, and there is the website. As I said, use it for a comment, either on the comments page or by a voicemail you have there, or just send me an email, info at thoughtshermes.com. All of that is very much appreciated. And um, yes, also in the new year, I will keep bugging you because it is important. It is really important. I do want... To keep this podcast uh, free of all publicity you see it on youtube for example i've not inserted any uh, any uh, any clips uh, for uh, selling stuff by other people i don't like that so i want to keep it all free of ads and for that i need your support because we have to find that podcast somehow some of you already are patrons thank you to those who are and have become lately uh, but we need more honestly we need more of you to keep that ad free and so please go to the patreon button on the website and click there and become a supporter starting at one dollar per episode i think that's fair and um well, if you if you uh, want to do a donation, a one-off payment, some people prefer that. There is also a donation button there. Your help is much, much appreciated. Well, today our topic um, is Manly Palmer Hall or Manly P. Hall or Mr. Hall, as our guest calls him. And our guest here today is uh, Tamra Lucid. I'll tell you more about her. Um, in a moment after the first piece of music but just so much that she has written that book it's it was for me really i would almost say in the in the occult book uh, row that i have here it was almost the discovery of the year that little book and um, so i am happy to talk to tamra here today but she is also and 
um, that's an important part of her life. Um, musician, punk, rock a riot girl, musician initially. And um, so um, I'm happy to present today here as the musical bit of the show, music by her band uh, Lucid Nation, which is of mainly composed of herself, Tamra Lucid, so that's her artist's name. And um, it's also with her partner, Ronnie, who is the other m most important part of the band, Lucid Nation. So Lucid Nation will be with us here on the show, uh, and we have her music here today to accompany us through the show. And, well, let's just go and start with that. Let's go into the first of the three pieces that Tamra gave us to play. It's called kindred and well it, you'll hear it it's a typical typical uh, 1980s 1990s punk rock music um, with her as the lead singer and and uh, one of the guitars so do we enjoy that first trip into lucid nations music and once again the song that we hear now is called kindred enjoy
can happen. It's true. Kindred by Lucid Nation with the lead singer Tamra Lucid, who is my guest here today on the show. And uh, if you follow the occult book market, you might have come across the title of that little book called Making the Ordinary Extraordinary. And I must say, it's quite an extraordinary book. I don't know. I really love that book. And I seem to be not the only one because apparently it is really doing very, very well out there. And if you haven't got it, you should really get it. It's a small booklet, actually. It has uh, 145 pages. And those of you who listen regularly to the show know that I don't usually praise the books themselves so much. But I just I got it. I read it in one, in one pass. Uh, it was great. It talks about uh, Tamra's experience for seven years in 1980s occult Los Angeles with Manly Palmer Hall, uh, or as she calls him, as you will hear, Mr. Hall. Extraordinary experiences she and her partner had because they became part of his inner circle of that man who has shaped quite a bit the 20th century with his, of course, leading book, The Secret um, Teachings of All Ages, which was one that still is one of the most important books on the market, especially if you start in the field and want to have a really broad overview and an interesting and same time in-depth overview. And Manny P. Hall never quite um, tells us uh, if he's practicing what he's practicing. Well, you get it that he is practicing and you know when you know him a bit, his teachings a bit, his not teachings, it's not teachings, it's readings, then uh, you will know uh, a bit more about that. But he will never declare himself like that. He's enigmatic without being enigmatic. And if you want to hear his voice, and that's part of his mystery, I'm sure, then you have to go to uh, YouTube, for example, or also to the website of the Philosophical Research Society, which he founded. You find lots of lots of tapes uh, where he teaches, and um, um, they are highly, highly interesting to listen to. Uh, if you want a topic to get more in-depth into a particular occult topic, you'll certainly find it with Manly P. Hall telling you something about it. So, enough said about that. I'm going to read you a short chapter, as I always do, from that book um, that Tamra uh, wrote for us. And um, the chapter that I'm reading is called First Lecture. And as it suggests, it will be the moment when she and Ronnie Pontiac, her partner, um, will be the first time in that in the, at the Philosophical Research Society's home in Los Angeles and listen to Manly Palmer Hall during a lecture. So here we go. We found seats and surveyed the scene. Beautiful floor arrangements on stage provided a lovely setting. I noticed a dark-haired guy with a limp glancing at the crowd from the small backstage area. He had the smirk of a musician. He fiddled around with a mic set up next to a big green chair with carved wooden handles. I found out later his name was Arthur Johnson, and indeed my suspicions were confirmed. He was a musician. Little did I know then that I was destined for the same despicable fate. Eventually, he would become the person most responsible for convincing me to write this book. At 11 a.m. sharp, the crowd settled down. A large, white-haired man with a cane moved slowly across the stage to the big chair. He sat down, gracefully greeting everyone with friendly nods and waves. Warm round of applause. And then he dove into a 90-minute lecture, note-free, without a pause. Lucid all the way through took us all on a little excursion with proper names, dates, publishers of books, Japanese and Chinese words, little asides about the authors, never a trip up. Now, for say, some reason unbeknownst to me, but probably the lindering effects of PTSD, I decided this was not Manly Hall. I thought this was a substitute. 
Midway through the lecture, he looked directly at me and started talking about weeds that grow in the cracks of sidewalks, an apt symbol of the opportunity for the soul to evolve through even the harshest conditions. He articulated what I had just seen walking to the lecture and what I always believed but I didn't dare express, because when I did, I'd get laughed at. But no one was laughing at him. I thought, if Manly Hall is half as good as this guy, he must be amazing. At the end of the lecture, he made a couple of announcements and informed his audience that refreshments awaited them in the courtyard, and while the others left their seats, he remained in ours. I turned to Ronnie and asked, who was that guy? He seemed confused by my question. It turned out Ronnie had the same, he looked right at me and said something directly to me, experience. A classic case of retribution, anxiety for ill behavior. Ronnie had caught Edgar Cayce's Earth Changes fever from Lorene, the same friend who had told us we should still go see Manlin Hall lecture. We were practically on our way to Virginia Beach. Lorene had already moved there. But that old man looked right at Ronnie and mentioned irrational fear of earthquakes as a sign of a guilty conscience. Plucked. Many people would later tell us about their own uncanny moments when it seemed Mr. Hall was talking directly to them about something that deeply troubled them. Later, when I worked with Mr. Hall, I realized there was no way he could see us in the audience. His vision was very poor by then. We were a colorful collection of blurs out there in our seats, but the right words were going to the right places. Call it guided by a higher consciousness or alignment with the Tao, or call it Zen, whatever you call it, he had it. Okay, that gave you a short glimpse into what Tamra has to tell us about Manly P. Hall and the way she tells it. It's just so refreshing. And she is also very open about herself. And as she is in the interview, we're going to hear now. I really enjoyed that interview, and I hope you will as well. And so let's now right away go to Los Angeles. Meet Tamra Lucid. You know that I will come back in about a bit over 30 minutes and talk to you briefly and play some more music for you. But now it's time to meet Tamra Lucid. Here comes the interview. You know, my dear listeners, sometimes uh, you have a surprise because um, I I have the pleasure to get quite a number of books here and for review and check them out. And then you get that nice, nice little book from Inner Traditions with 144 pages called Making the Ordinary Extraordinary and think, hey, that's nice. And you start reading it and then you can't stop reading it suddenly. And <laughs> that's what happened to me when I received that book uh, by my today's guest, Tamra Lucid. Tamra, hello. How are you today? I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? Uh, thank you. It's great to have you. And well, to lift the mystery, of course, that book is about Manly P. Hall. No, it's about Tamra and her experience in L.A., in occult L.A., as she says, um, with Manly Palmer Hall. Uh, Manly Palmer Hall, one of the great personalities of the Western esoteric tradition in the 20th century, certainly. And um, well, Tamra, um, first of all, before we talk about that book, um, maybe you should give our readers and listeners here uh, a little bit of background because, um, um, of course, they have not read that book yet, as I, I do. So um, we should take them a bit into the thing. Um, what happened to you that you suddenly turned up in Manly P. Hall's circle, so to speak? I think like... Everyone else who discovered Mr. Hall, um, we discovered Ronnie and I, Ronnie is my husband, my mm -hmm. boyfriend at the time. Um, we discovered the big book, The Secret Teachings. Yeah. And it was such an experience, um, basically for a couple of ignorant kids to have the worlds that opened up 
via that book. Mm. Um, completely mind altering, mind blowing. And, um, I actually thought, you know, obviously by the look of the book and, and the style of it and everything, you know, this man has been gone a long time. (laughs) My first question was how long is this guy is great. How long has he been dead? Um, and Ronnie was, well, it, it must've been quite a while because this is like the fifth edition, blah, blah, blah. And then we were speaking about the book with a friend of ours and she said, oh no, he's, he's alive and well, and he's in Las Feliz. He's, you know, 20 minutes away. <laughs> and we were rather shocked by that, that revelation alone. Um, and we ended up going to our first lecture and, um, being dazzled by him, of course. And like everyone probably went there, right? Yeah. I, it, it's, it's so wonderful to hear everybody who'd been to the lectures, you know, describe, Oh, it was like he was speaking right to me and uh, same thing happened to us. And, um, we decided to volunteer. Right. And I pretty much got hired on the spot, but Ronnie was not. Mm-hmm. And, um, then we got a, a phone call and, um, he had mentioned, Ronnie had mentioned to the screener that, um, in fact, he did understand several languages and he'd grown up around that and he could read with a dictionary, a number of languages and blah. So he, they were, they were rather, well, we'll let you know. And, but I had all kinds of secretarial skills and they were very interested in those. And they were like, okay, we'll, we'll give you a call. Why don't you, why don't you show up? Well, the, the phone call came and they were like, yeah, Tamara, come on down. And I asked, is there anything for Ronnie? And then it was no, we'll let you know. Uh, well, as it happened, um, Apparently, Mr. Hall got wind of, of the, the language skills that Ronnie possessed, and he was working on the alchemical bibliography at the time, mm-hmm. and he needed a reader. And um, Ronnie got an appointment with Mr. Hall, which was, of course, you know, just a, okay, um, I get to meet Manly Hall. This is wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And Mr. Hall just handed him the galley and said, this is a galley. I need you to proofread it and, um, get busy. This is your job. If you so desire. Now, when Ronnie left the office, of course, the the vice president at the time, Pat Irvin took the galley away and said, I I don't think so. And Ronnie was rather relieved. Hmm because this was very intimidating. He he wasn't sure at all if he could do anything of the sort. And so he said, yes, take it, please. And we kind of thought, well, you know, maybe he made a mistake. Hmm. Um, so he's fallible. He's human. Um, gave us a little too much. Ronnie thought he gave him a little too much credit than he deserved. And, and he, he, he was just excited. I got to meet Manly Hall, but then, um, that evening he got a phone call from Mr. Hall's secretary, Edith. And she said, tomorrow morning, 9 AM, Mr. Hall's office, be there. So Ronnie went back and Mr. Hall slid the galley over to Ronnie again and said, you now work for me. You will only answer to me. If anyone interferes, you tell me. Now you take that galley home and start start your job. This is your job. You're going to help edit this alchemical bibliography. So on the drive home, Ronnie said, we're going to have to stop at a couple stores and get some dictionaries (laughs) and some alchemical books because I'm in over my head. But he actually performed beautifully. And Mr. Hall assured him, you know, I will help you with each step. I will go over your work every day. You'll be fine. Go ahead. I think you can do it, kid. And he did. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
What do you think? I mean, that sounds such an amazing story to happen to anyone with anyone such a a great person you admire, right? You just wish mm -hmm. that happened to you. But what do you think that Manly P. Hall or Mr. Hall, I always like when you call him Mr. Hall. Also in the Mr. book, Hall. you always call him Mr. Hall. And yeah. before I go for my question, why is that? Is that by respect or what, what makes you use that terminology? It's, it's definitely respect, first and foremost. Mm. But yeah. I mean, he was, he was Mr. Hall. Mm. Um, we, he would say, call me manly. And it was just, I just shake my head. No, I can't do that. It's just. If you met him again today, would you, because you are older now, was it the question of use or is it the man himself? that? It's for? him himself. I would always, I, you know, I call him Mr. Hall in the book. So yes. that kind of says, yeah, that it's Mr. Hall. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm so always rather shocked at people who call it people who, you know, go, Oh, Manly would do this. And it's sorry. Like, you didn't even yeah, know yeah. the man. <laughs> exactly. Well, I, I probably do the same. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I understand. <laughs> He's also, I, he was also so, um, genuinely friendly and humble and gentle that of course people felt familiar with him when you listen to him now on youtube it, it's still the same thing i can see why people would say well manly wouldn't do that or manly was said this and and that, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that at all it's just for me personally i always referred to him as man mr hall and i still do i just that's Yeah. That's my point of yeah. reference. It's, I don't know how really to say that properly that people will understand what I mean, but I just say it, maybe somebody gets it, but that's part of the charm of that book to me, because it's really a charm because um, your language and for example, that Mr. Hall, it is always to me, the right distance. You write about a person without revering him but showing respect but without blaming him either when things go wrong you know it's 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 you can't somehow manage to find exactly the right distance to the person you're writing about how, how do you do that a lot of reading um a lot of writing at the time when i decided well <laughs> There, there were two motivations that, that coincided, that collided, which was I was, I was writing with a direct, writing for a director and writing screenplays and he, Boris Hussein, and he's a master storyteller, mm. just a master at his, at his work, at his craft. So my skills, my writing skills were very up. And at the same time, I had Arthur Johnson, um, who was at PRS, who we became friends with at PRS. Um, he was transitioning and he was he was doing those um, scary kind of warnings about don't do what I did and write a bunch of stuff and then never publish it, and never share it. And he, he also specifically told me, you had a unique relationship with that man. And people should know about that. You should share that. It's important. Mm. So, you know, I took that very seriously. So I was taking very seriously the warnings from Arthur. And I was also taking very seriously the um, education I was re receiving from Mr. Hussein. And then the pandemic hit and Ronnie and I were saying, well, how do we make this a constructive moment? And I, we both agreed, well, I could do the Manly Hall story right now. I feel like mm. my skills are up as a writer. And also I wanted, I, I wanted it to be my voice. I wanted it to be me telling my story. It is kind of the way I speak. I'm, I can either go, it can always go two ways. I can over explain the daylights out of something and make you dizzy, or I can simply and very effectively and very quickly and hope that you get with the choice of words, the intention that I had 
by explaining this situation. And it is up to the reader. Um, I wanted to make that very, very clear, too. I'm trying to paint you, paint you a picture of what I experienced, but the experience as archetype, I want you to judge for yourself and come to your own conclusions. Right. Also, I think th the reason it is clipped and quick, um, one screenplays, of course, but also I think in, in a, a funny way, it, it is like a very quick punk song. Um, <laughs> you know, th those songs are quick and direct and simple. And yeah. that I also wanted the book to read that way. Well, now I, with your reply, I have about five little paths that opened and I want to go and along them all. So let's take them one by one. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, let's, let's start with the last one. Of course, um, you have to tell people now about your well background. If I say background, I don't mean at the beginning of the book only because mm -hmm. that's one of the charms of the book as well, that when you start reading it, I don't want to give away it all. Right. But um, uh, they, it starts with you and how you met Ronnie. Mm -hmm. And this is such a touching story. Uh, I think people can relate very deeply to that. I think to me, that's one of the mysteries of the book, that one is already in love with both of you. Oh. When you meet Mr. Hall, right? And mm -hmm. that's why that's why it goes along so well then. Um, but so tell tell us a bit about your background, because um, uh, I don't think everybody here listening knows what your background then and now is, because you said punk, of course, punk plays an important role in your in your stage life, right? Mm -hmm. Well, uh Oh, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> um, it's like I wanted to say, well, which background are you referring to? <laughs> well, um, exactly. You're quite right. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, so maybe we can re redo the question. Let me redo the question. Let's start with the background when you meet Ron and what happened. Mm -hmm. And then let's jump to the end of the book. What happened after you left uh, uh, the Mr. Hall's uh, building, right? All right. Well, when I met Ronnie, I was um, kind of feral. I was, I was kicking around lousy jobs um, not really uh, happy at all, and and basically kind of adrift. And I was I was at um, the Rainbow Bar and Grill, the notorious Rainbow Bar and Grill, mm. and um, someone had dragged me there, and I, I was getting um, pursued by some unsavory characters, and. I had briefly met Ronnie inside the club and I knew that I was, I was in a bad place. Um, my girlfriend had gotten me into a bad situation mm. and right before now I was staring at Ronnie, like, I think I'm going to ask this guy for help. I have to and ask you, how old were you both then? I was about, I think I was 19. Mm. So he would be 20. I was 19. So very young. Yeah. And the proprietor of the club um, intervened as I was making my way towards Ronnie. And he said, hey, hey, hey girl, that's a bad guy. You, you avoid that guy. He's trouble. And you're a nice girl. And it's just... I was really amused by his commentary about me and, and Ronnie. I was okay. And so I proceeded to do what I, I damn well pleased. And I walked up to Ronnie and I said, I need your help. Will you help me? And, um, you know, he was standing there all in black in the rain, the black cigarette. <laughs> and I describe him as looking like a, uh, um, evil anime villain, <laughs> you know, he, he did not, he did not look like the kind of person you'd ask for help, but he was the kind of person I'd ask for help. And, um, I don't know it, it, it pinged some sort of noble thing inside him and he went, 
all right, let me get my drummer. And Mm -hmm. so he defended me and made sure nothing bad happened to me. And basically two weeks later, I moved in (laughs) with him Yeah. and, um, our strange little worlds collided. So t- playing that for, now he was a musician, of course. Um, and, um, but he was, he, he was not having a, a good, it was not good for him. And um, so he was about as, as adrift as I was. So two adrifts are better than one. So we combined our adriftedness mm-hmm. and, then we found that book. Now, fast forward into how I became a singer. Um, the strange synchronicities, um, the strange pangs at um, my psychology, um, issues that, that needed to be dealt with, um, all happened around the music for me. Um, there was, um, you know, being able to say in alchemical terms, transmute the base metal that I was into something golden, um, to take and and also at that time when I decided finally to be in a band with Ronnie and um and also I was not going to be the singer. Um <laughs> yes, that that was never say never. Um I'm never gonna sing. <laughs> um <laughs> and what happened? She started to be the lead singer. Exactly, it all fell on me. So um never say never. <laughs> But exactly. through just the amazing synchronicity, there happened to be a genre of music called riot girl that was suddenly available and here comes the cat and um suddenly availed itself and it was about feminism abuse survivors um trauma survivors and how using music and this particular genre of music to um heal the trauma made itself available to me. So it it's like it was custom built for me to apply all the metaphysics I had learned and all the um, self-help through metaphysics that I had learned. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. I'm sorry, cat issues just made them so, availed themselves. Oh, <laughs> um, cats. Cats have all uh, rights uh, here, so no worry. Oh, yeah. All, <laughs> All bets are off. Cat, cat has to have their their moment. Oh, But God. um, yeah, it, it it it. So that genre of music availed itself, and I availed myself to it. It was absolutely a, a perfect vehicle for my expression and my um, uh, allowing myself to become. A, a, a whole person, um, a, a healed person. And so I, I got to apply tons of metaphysics. In fact, you know, I considered and, and still do consider my experience in Riot Girl and the music scene in general as a total alchemical experiment. And it was incredibly successful And shockingly so, you would you wouldn't think those two would mix and and, and mix well, um, but they did for me. It worked for me. And um, well, I'm not surprised if music and uh, especially that type of music has that effect. Um, mm-hmm. I, uh, it's my st- strict belief that it can do that. Any type of music can if if it applies to the person that that is working with that music. I would say music therapy. Absolutely. Well, yeah, that's the, that sounds very exoteric to me, but I, I'd go, I'd push it a bit further, <laughs> but in the end it comes to that, of course. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, talking about exoteric and esoteric, but what a 19 year old girl, woman in, in LA in the late seventies, right? We're talking about eighties you know, already. Okay. Early eighties. Um, yes. 
then um, what would, why would a couple like you, I'd almost say fall for that book, you know, fall for the, 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 the Mr. Hall's great Bible, so to speak. Um, what attracted you? Were you special or was that some kind of trend within, within the milieu that you were? Or why did it happen just to you? Was that again synchronicity? Well, I, th I think it's a partly syn synchronicity. Um, also, um, I love history. Mm -hmm. Really, really love history. And, and so th this was, these were historical documents, as it were. Um, it was, it was fascinating because it was a cult and it was spiritual um, yet it was the accounts of people's experiences healing themselves and finding their 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 true nature, their true center. Um, it's as the statue says in front of PRS at the very bottom. It says, "Know thyself." Mm -hmm. um, this is this is a principle that. Um, I think has guided me th through that. So when I opened up that book, it helped me to know myself because I did have an interest in these things. I did have an interest in, um, the music of the spheres, um, the harmony of healthy mind, healthy spirit, healthy body. Um, the, The cat's putting on a clinic, I tell you what, right <laughs> now. <laughs> um, uh, all these things were, were I think, already um, just the things, the laws of attraction. Let's call it the law of attraction. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first things that I remember as a child, six years old or something, reading was a really... Um, lousy, but it had nice pictures, um, like a supermarket encyclopedia here. There's your encyclopedia uh, of, um, Greek myths. And I found the gods to be absolutely the most fascinating, wonderful, inspiring things I've ever read about. And I was six years old and I knew that right. stuff was true. <laughs> so, yeah. so it was something that was in you somehow, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Because that's what intrigued me in the book, that when once you met Mr. Hall, I you see I changed my um, my determination <laughs> for him. Uh, once you met him, you, of course, you, you explain very clearly what what happened to you, even though I have to ask you, that's one of the other parts I have to ask you what exactly happens there. But um, that you even went there and see all those old ladies and gentlemen, I guess, who mm -hmm. went to the PRS at the time. Um, and you get in the middle of them and don't feel awkward. That already must have been something in you that, 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 that brought you there, wasn't it? I was a menopause baby, so my mom was an old lady, so maybe I was very comfortable <laughs> with seniors. Maybe. <laughs> that could be it. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, wait. But then, okay, but then the encounter, you see, you described that very clearly that everybody in the audience felt kind of looked at and understood by Mr. Hall mm -hmm. when he spoke. But then when you got to know him a bit better, what what made that attraction to the man and still makes it today people don't meet him anymore but they listen as you said mm -hmm. on youtube to his to his tapes they they read his books what is it in manly p hall or mr hall that is so special that um, made him the person that personality that he is well the quality of the um intellectual pursuit Mm -hmm. Um, the elevation, um, he was trying with every step to be in perfect meditation and to be of service. Mm -hmm. This service was to share wisdom, ancient wisdom and, um, methods of healing and, um, self-help. And um, 
again, the elevation of the intellect to, um, that's the other cat. I hear. (laughs) (laughs) Um, To elevate the human experience to a point where people could live better lives, to be genuinely happy in their lives, Mm -hmm. to have some sort of resilience, some sort of base where even under bad circumstances, tough circumstances, they could somehow through their spiritual strength and intellectual strength be able to live a quality life. It's it's really just to elevate the quality of your life through education, through a little spiritual education, Mm -hmm. things like that. Was that the capacity that Mr. Hall had, which made him invite Ron to that task? Um, Because of course, as you said, for Ron and for you, it, even for the Secretary General, it was amazing that he would do that. I mean, just go up to a guy he had never met before and who had told him, I, I can read a few languages and, and give him that task, which must have been very close to his heart that it went well. So he must have seen or understood something about Ron that made him so sure. What, what, what kind of, how would you describe that capacity of his to do that? Well, it's kind of opportunist, isn't it? You know, here's somebody who knows languages, you know, very willing to learn, very (laughs) willing to take instructions. And um, he needed an editor. And here comes, here comes Ronnie, you know, and he's like, yeah, let's, let's take the kid out for a spin, see if it works. You know, all we can do is try. This was also the um, um, allow the world to, show you where to go. Mm -hmm. I I did. I've, I've used that. I use that, um, myself in my own life, um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. allow the world to, um, tell you which way you should allow the world to be your teacher Mm -hmm. and instruct you where you should be going and what you should be doing. Um, it does work. Um, you have to learn, uh, you've got to learn the certain skill sets to do that. Um, because it's tough, you know, to, to have that ability to be calm and open and passive and Mm -hmm. not let your own, um, desires get in the way of the lessons that need to be learned or paid attention to. Um, that's a mighty big skill set right there. Um, and it takes time. It takes a lot of time and a constant renewal and work. Um, because our our desires and our needs change over time, so yeah, you have to be able to wing it and improvise and and be able to see where it it leads you. <laughs> Definitely. Well, you call that chapter where you describe that that moment where he hands over that task the first time to Ron. You call it appointment with destiny, right? right? Um, so. Wow. In what way did that change yours and Ron's destiny? We became friends with Mr. Hall because of that. Mm-hmm. He he decided, you know, to take us under his wing. Um, that changed Ronnie's life entirely because he went from being, you know, your basic um, San Fernando Valley nihilist to a, um, a scholar. Mm. And he realized that his intelligence was best served in intelligent ways rather than destructive bad habits that had been acquired over, you know, um, through abuse. And so that was his, that was the great, there was the alchemical transformation again, turning base (laughs) metal into gold. I I was going to say that sounds magical and alchemical again, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. So it was Mr. Hall in that sense, a magician or an alchemist? Mm. Buddhist. <laughs> it's a good, 
a good a good martial arts teacher because a martial arts teacher simply, you know, observes your behavior and decides what your skill set is yeah. and guides you to that place so that you become a master of your art right. or your life. <laughs> So refreshing, that talk, just like the book, and to me, ideal to start this new year. I hope you're enjoying as much as I did when I spoke to Tambra. So, as you heard, and as you know by now, that she is also a musician, that uh, after those years at the Philosophical Research Center, she um, went on stage as a performing artist, which she still sometimes does, I believe. And, uh, well, uh, Tamra sent me three tracks that we may play in this show to her, hear her voice not only speaking, but also singing. Right, so we right away will delve into that, and the next piece that we are going to hear is called Night Prowler. Night Prowler... Um, PCH to be precise and um, uh, after that second piece of music we'll return for our second part of the interview and by now those of you who are regulars know that immediately at the end of the interview the third music piece will follow and that will again of course be Lucid Nation and that time it will be Shoreline Goodbye and after the third piece of music do not leave because I will announce, of course, the next guest on our show, uh, which will be next week, next Sunday on January the 9th. Okay, so once again, Night Prowler PCH right now. Then we return for the second half of the interview. And after that, it shall be Shoreline Goodbye, both pieces by Lucid Nation and their lead singer, Tamra Lucid my interview guest here today. Enjoy. <laughs>
I found in the spring 1984 journal of the PRS, the PRS journal, I found that little note. Manly P. Hall recently had the pleasure of officiating at the wedding of Tamara, not Tamara, Tamara, oh, yeah. Spivy and Ron Hogart. The ceremony was held on the grounds of the Hall's home. The weather was most accommodating and yeah. after the ceremony, the wedding party adjourned to a Thai restaurant for a delightful oriental refreshment. Ron Hogart and his new wife are close personal friends of Mr. and Mrs. Hall. Ron is now attending Occidental College, has lectured a number of times at PRS and is dedicating his life to public service. We wish for this fine couple a full, rich and rewarding life together. Uh, I adore the language already. It's not only what is being said, but how it's being said. We, we're adjourning to a Thai restaurant, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, That's describing the weather. Is that... Is that, I, I don't know if he wrote that himself, of course, but. No, uh, no, that was Pearl. That was oh, that's Pearl. Pearl. Was Thomas, that her style library. or was that, or oh, was that yes. his style as well? That was her style. She, <laughs> now she, she was a teenager um, when she um, first saw Mr. Hall. She was a very young girl. Her mom took her to see Mr. Hall and she was a head librarian. When I met her, she was at least in her eighties and, um, sharp as a tack and um but yeah she was she was fun she was a lot of fun <laughs> but all those how was that were... wedding tell us about the wedding how how did you see it before you adjourned um did, what, yeah what what how did it you was, was... what did he do well well he he and marie chose the date uh, well they decided we should get married um, yeah, so that it would fit into the astrological uh, context or... Oh, yeah. Marie and he um, really battled over where the sun was supposed to be. Um, 10th house or 11th house. Mr. Hall wanted the 11th house. It's personable. It's friendly. Um, nice and calm and steady. He was like, look at the Saturn in their chart. You should... We should make it nice. Mm -hmm. And Marie was having none of that. She was like, nope, they're going to further my work. We need the sun in the 10th house. It'll be great. And she literally was holding me back, physically holding me back. She was a tough little girl. And um, she was like, wait, nope, it's not time yet. And everyone was there, Edith and Lynn Blessing going, let her go. <laughs> She's supposed to get married. Mr. Hall has been out there for 10 minutes. You can't leave him standing out there in the sun like that. And she was like, nope, the sun's going to be in the 10th house. And that's that. And by God, the sun's in the 10th house. I'll have, you know, and, um, <laughs> yeah, that, that was, that was, that was an amazing moment. It was literally, um, you know, release the bride. It's now in the 10th house. She was watching the clock and holding me. And going, no, the sun is going to be ah. the 10th. <laughs> but she was right, apparently, because your wedding yep. seemed to, to go out well, right? <laughs> well, it was legal. And uh, we were, I was very impressed by that. Um, I was very impressed seeing Mr. Hall in his black robes with his cross. And, uh, was that the, 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 the gold Don Laman or what cross would he wear there? The, the, um, is it the Hermetic? Oh, I'm getting it wrong. Oh, the, oh, the, the Hermetic cross. I mean, the one that is used by the Golden Dawn as well as, as, as a Laman, right? That was the, I have no idea. The, the cross with the pentacles on it. and then hmm. I, I'm going to put up a picture of it because we have a little um, miniature version of it that Ronnie got when he was one of the five fellows. Mm -hmm. um, because at, as you can see, my attention to detail that way, when I'm writing, my attention to detail is off the charts. Yeah, when I'm talking, not so much. Um, <laughs> so, um, it probably is. It, it, yeah. It's a, yeah, I, I it's suppose the, um, so. I suppose yeah, it's so. The, um, the Faith Hermetic Cross. 
Yeah, I believe okay. that's yeah, what I it's called. That's the one. That's the one. Yeah. And um, so, do you do you would you say that the difference in seeing what is important for your wedding between the two, between Mr. and Mrs. Hall, would also describe their difference in character? Was he the guy who was looking for the calm, calm and and soft uh, solution, and she was rather the fighter? She was feisty. Mm. Um, you know, remember the, the, the big portrait of her, um, my God, she was beautiful. Um, this portrait of her in her red dress and right in the corner, her, her son had put caution, high voltage. Mm. Um, definitely she, she was the high voltage type. She was definitely type A. Um, she was very, you know, into her mission and, um, getting her word across, but she had a hard time getting the word words across. Um, she was very intellectual, very mathematical. Um, she was German, wasn't she? Oh, she sure was. Um, <laughs> I you. actually, I'm not in Austrian. So. <laughs> I'm not. Okay. I'm Austrian. There is a difference. I know that difference. Um, but, um, yeah, she, she was, she was definitely high octane, He, he was very low key. He, you know, is very much a Buddhist. Um, I, I describe him as a koi fish in a pond at mm. PRS. Yes. Um, it, it's very gentle, very easygoing. If the tide went this way, so would we, and that would be fine. And then we'd go back again with the other one. And it, that's very Piscean that way. Um, very gentle. He did have his, you know, This, these are my parameters. This is what I do. This is what I don't do. Um, definitely. Um, but, um, yeah, she, she, <laughs> yes, it, it could be described like that. 11th house and 10th house. Uh, 10th house. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you just described him as a Buddhist. I'm, I'm not surprised, but I, I've never heard you or anyone else say it that clearly. Would would that be a statement that he would have made himself as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't it, aware of that really. His life was was a constant meditation. Um, But that that could be uh, Western meditation as well, right? Uh, I'm, I'm 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 I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm asking you. You you met him. I didn't. Well, I didn't interrogate him and ask for a rundown, but yes, um, um, he, he I, I think he would describe himself as Buddhist. And I think he, he very much, at least with us, encouraged a, a, a Buddhist um, perspective mm -hmm. and, and maybe um, attitude towards things. Um, singing for me, you know, for someone who was afraid to speak and, um, pretty much unable to, um, one of the, the moments in, in singing for me came in, in a coffee house in downtown LA when we did, we finished our set and there, there was nobody there and, um, we were going to pack up and leave. And, and the, um, the proprietor of the establishment basically said, Hey, we ain't got no place to go place, make something up. Mm -hmm. And, um, I equated it to the Bodhisattva step of faith. Um, I just, yeah. I thought, you know, I believe in the music of the spheres. I believe that there's, um, everything is made up of song, of sound, of vibration. There's got to be a song out here in the atmosphere somewhere for me. I'm going to just open myself up to it like a good Buddhist would open up to the universe and hope a song drops in. And it did. Tune it in, was, so to speak, right? Yeah. It's, it's tune in and let go. Yeah. You know, yeah. don't, don't make it yours. Um, make it, I often described it as, as being on a um, merry-go-round, closing your eyes and holding your arm out and mm -hmm. catching the ring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it can be that fun. Um, it, I actually, uh, a lot of times I felt like the best meditations I ever did 
was when I said, just play, roll the tape, let's do this. And I would, calmest moments I've, I've ever experienced, the, mo- the most um, meditative, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. doesn't, really doesn't make sense. But given the way I, I used music, yes, it does. <laughs> right, right, right. No, I see that. I see that. I was just so surprised by that statement because um, he is so much seen, Mr. Hall is so much seen as, uh, as a representative of the Western tradition because mm-hmm. all the talks you hear by him are about that. He was mm-hmm. a Freemason, you know, and all that. And, and then, I mean, that's not at all a contradiction, but it's, it's a surprise because he's not outwardly or seen today by people as that and that makes mm-hmm. that's why i asked yeah oh he had he had such love um for the eastern he he really did want to have a um a, a companion um book to the big book that was the eastern traditions and it it was it was very sad because this is of course at the end of his life and he was starting to work on that with ronnie And Ronnie kept finding so many um, well-researched scholarly academic works that that really, um, for Mr. Hall to to even assimilate all that information, it, it was that was a lifetime of work right there. And Mr. Hall didn't have that much time left, mm-hmm. and so it it. it That, that, that didn't pan out and a shame, a, 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 truly a shame. Um, right. but yet, um, in a way sort of his approach to life was an example. And he always said, teach by example, um, of a Buddhist way of being. Mm-hmm. 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 Well, we've now touched that, that, um, last part of your book which of course is kind of a sad part because it talks about the breakup uh, i think we can call it a breakup right between between the two of you and and mr hall and yeah and a little bit also about the things that happened with him afterwards um uh And, but also there, I I keep making compliments, but um, the way you described it, it's never accusing, it's never, um, it makes you feel sad when you read the book, but never aggressive, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. uh, Did you feel like that back then as well? Or is it by distance that you learned to feel like that about it? I got to be a better Buddhist. Well, so, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it depends on which, um, I could say which angle or camera you want to talk to. Um, you know, there's the girl that absolutely adored that man mm. and who helped me clean up my life. And I, my job was to protect him. Mm. And I just, <laughs> I feel like I failed, you know, that's, Mm -hmm. you know, part of the reason I, I never told the story was because I certainly felt Mm -hmm. guilt, guilt, the the easy one, the shame that I, I had, um, if I had been able to explain it better, um, there's so many coulda, shoulda, wouldas in there. Um, and at the end of the day, um, I didn't have proof. Now, had I been the girl I am today, um, I might still have been absolutely crazy. Stay away from that guy. He's bad news, just like Mario. Um, Mm. And all I could do was to tell him what I saw. What I saw was a dangerous man up to no good. I did tell him what I saw. That was my job. Um, Mm. Had I known Richard was um, a martial artist, um, I would have walked up to Richard and said, you worked for Sinatra. Um, 
you know, a bad guy, when you see, I would have told it, I would have told it to everybody. Um, I just, I, I would have just told everybody I would have been loud and um, I would have gone to every person I know at that place and say, you can't let this guy in. You can't let this guy in. Mm. That might've been a different way of approaching it. Um, really made myself a pest. Um, and th- th- this is, th- this is the problem. I had no proof that this guy was up to no good. And yet <laughs> look at the result. Um, yeah, sure. Sure. Of course you <laughs> prove you were right. Right. And also you have to look at the, look at the, um, unfortunate paradox that went on there. You know, Pat Irvin, um, had every right to grab that galley from Ronnie and say, we don't know who you are or what you're up to. And you look down right nefarious. No. Um, she had no proof, but Mr. Hall had a habit of, like I said, allowing the world to bring him what he needed. And, um, was Fritz what he needed? I mean, if you want to look at it that way, was there <laughs> yeah. karma well, there? Uh, well, that's a, yeah. Also from a hermetic point of view, this is a very good question, of course, mm-hmm. N- not just from a, from an Eastern point of view. It's also, yeah. Yeah. Was he taking out the bad guy? I'll take you with me, buddy. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think Fritz had done a, done plenty of damage before he got to Mr. Hall. I, I mean, he was running away from, um, um, almost killing a woman in, in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- th- he, he was a very questionable person. Mm. Um, and unfortunately I had no answers about that questionability. Um, I didn't know that he had borrowed money from the halls to do his little scam in, um, Hawaii and then come back, you know, I'm sure he told Mr. Hall it was a triumph, but he really wanted to come back and help. Who knows? And like I say in the book, maybe his intentions were all good and he didn't do, do the groundwork you need to do before you um, start acting like some sort of spiritual leader, um, some sort of helper. You got to know yourself and I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm yeah. really not sure if Fritz knew himself or not. Do I, do I hear in your voice rightly still a little bit of sadness today when you talk about it? Oh, breaks my heart. Hmm. So not, li- I don't hear right. It's not a little bit of sadness. N- no. Yeah. 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 I, I, I can understand that. Hmm. Yeah. You, the, I mean, we all have regretful moments in our lives. Of this course. Is one of them. Of if I could go back and, and do it different, I would. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can't. We can't. Gotta accept yeah. that. Mm. Um, exactly. It's always hard. And he was, you know, he was telling us, kids, get out. It's time for you to go. Everybody's going to be dying. You, you got to go. You got to go live your life. Your life is not here. That's, you know, what a thing to do. Yeah. And on the other hand, maybe with that part, even if it was harsh and not understandable for you back then, maybe with that part, he was in the end, right? No? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We both had our own lives to live and we couldn't, yeah. you know, it was very safe there. Um, that was a good place to be, but we weren't challenged. It wasn't challenging the things that we needed to challenge at, at that time. Hmm. Yeah. No, no, I, I see. What, what do you think Mr. Hall means and, or can mean? Maybe let's put it rather that way. Can mean to young people today. Um, will he still be... Uh, attractive to a young couple who is looking for self-improvement in the 21st century, do you think? And if so, where should somebody like that start with his work today? I think that, you know, like I said, what he taught was a wholesome, intelligent, 
um, healthy way of living and viewing the world and yourself. Um, people learning self-awareness um, as well as all the beautiful mystical teachings, understanding that most of what magic is, what alchemy is, all these, these different ways of, of learning and um, perceptions and secrets. The secret is the self, know thyself. To take that knowledge once you've got a, a firm foundation and go out in the world and try and do as much good as possible. That's what magic should be. And it can be. Um, the delight in the experience that all these teachers, <laughs> Golden Dawn, Levy, uh, God help him, even Crowley, um, can, these life experiences um, are to be uh, observed. Now, see what was, try to see what was motivating them mm -hmm. and what their experiments with life became, what their lives became. Um, and now s apply that to yourself. Self-knowledge is power. And if you want power, have that power of yourself. Um, when you learn that, that life lesson, the world opens up tremendous. There's a universe out there for you. Um, and I think that's, I think that people are, are still trying to find, um, what am I doing here? Why am I here? Hmm. Um, what's it all for? All those, those conversations are in all those lectures. Um, everybody asks those questions. We're humans. That's the human experience. So whether you're a hundred or you're 10, you're still going to be asking those questions. And he's a great place to start on a healthy place to start for people. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think anyone can enjoy uh, him. Uh, I, I like that word, that very word you just said. He's a healthy place to start with. It's so mm -hmm. balanced and it's so, mm -hmm. well, to me, it feels you can go anywhere from there, but you have a good a good base. It reminds me when I when I took my first writing lessons. I was twenty ish, so I started very late. But so I need. I I had a teacher. She drove me crazy the first half year because she taught me every single little move, not to be shying the horse, you know, not to, be, to get, uh, not to do things wrong. And then because I had that, I could do other things on other horses with other people. And I never felt insecure. And that's exactly what Manly Behold is for me in the esoteric world. He gives you that background, which is not judging. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, right? This is, mm -hmm. my, this is just my point of view. He's not judging. He is giving you uh, a path in your hand and look for yourself. But on that path, you're safe. And then when you master that, then you go further and look for yourself. Mm -hmm. Would you would you agree with that? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and where, it's also where, yeah. follow your heart. I mean, for me, you know, I took just, I found great joy in, in studying the Greek myths, but the Greek myths are what? They're symbolic language. Um, they're telling you a story about humanity. Um, certainly that's, that's the, the thing they're, they're, they're trying to tell you life experience, what it's like to be a human on the planet. Um, and the further, Back in time, you go the, the um, language, the symbolic language, it 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 shifts. So you've got to be able to be, you know, clever. Use your brain. Now, it's a symbolic language. What's it saying to you? Mm -hmm. Why is it saying that to you? Again, the this the discovery of these other modes of thinking, these other traditions, allows you to also when you step back 
see what you're motivated by. What do you find interesting about it? Why? Um, and as you understand them and what they're saying, you'll understand yourself and what motivates you. And so you've got a double learning experience right there. You're going to be a smarter human being and smarter human beings make the world a whole lot better. Yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. Exactly. And would you say that um, the message that in the end, all the currents, all the teachings have a common, a common ground, I would call it not a common end. Would you would you say that's part of his teachings as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. He, he loved showing the similarities of things. Yeah. And how this equals that, this goes to this, this goes to that, um, could be a compulsive disorder, like go, goes to like, but, um, it's actually, it's, it's actually pulling, think of it as, as pulling threads and weaving them into a perfect tapestry, a perfect mandala that explains the human experience and the, the experience of the soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What you do not mention in the book, maybe, well, certainly on purpose, but maybe because you did not want to and still don't want to. So if you don't want to, that's all right. But I'm asking, um, did you what kind of practice, if any, did you have or did you do? Did you practice during the time at PRS and Are you today still practicing uh, something in in the field of the Western or Eastern traditions? It's kind of um, like the last thing I, I put in there, one of the last things he wrote. My practice is my daily life, the people I meet, the situations I find that present themselves to me. Mm -hmm. um, within the context or the confines of those experiences, I apply the metaphysics that I've learned a little, little bit of everything, a little bit of Buddhism, a little bit of alchemy, a little bit of magic, a little bit of paganism, a mm -hmm. little bit of the Greek gods. Um, you know, there's nothing more beautiful than sitting in a California evening um, when the sun is just about gone and it's actually quiet for a moment and looking at the sky, hearing the birds and having a glass of wine and saying, thank you, Dionysus. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You, you, you mentioned exactly that at the end of the epilogue, even of the book that <laughs> Mr. Hall himself said, He was reticent in discussing his own practices and beliefs, right? Yeah. I so mean, it's, it's, it's personal, you know, it's, it's sure. It's, sure. And it, it seems, um, people love to make it glamorous. Uh, it, you know, basically it's hard work. It's hard work taking, um, what you're born with and making it into something golden. Um, a lot of people never recover from traumas that they experience in childhood. Um, and some people make it their life's work to do just that, um, not to be what I was given to make something better out of it. Mm. And I think that's one of the things that Mr. Hall can provide and, and metaphysics in general can provide is, is a way of taking what maybe would have been something that's Oh, you know, Arthur would call it a handicap and, you know, making it into something glorious. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be bad. That's at the same time, very spiritual and very political, isn't it? <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, but it's, isn't it the end the same? It should be at least. <laughs> You're laughing. <laughs> 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 okay, I take that laugh for a yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
or is it? <laughs> is it exactly for the for the final question mark of this interview? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, but before I let you go, Tamra, um, what are your future plans we should know about? I mean, um, I don't know if I'm right, but from what I get from the internet, I mean, this, this, this book, this little book has, um, to the surprise of many, is making an extraordinary path, right? Um, and, uh, uh, um, so this might tempt you to to do other things in that direction. Are you tempted? Oh yeah, I've got lots of stories. <laughs> We've got the whole music <laughs> thing. Yeah, but I'm talking about our occult field or so. Well, Ronnie has has got a book coming out next mm -hmm. um, yeah. with inner traditions, um, and then um, we also have. Um, after that, we redid the um, the or hymns of Orpheus. Um, that's mentioned in the book. Um, that that's something that's suddenly coming out and uh, quite a, quite a bit. Huh? Those 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 Orphic translations and hmm. they're so good. They they just they they just so work. And you know, there it is. The six year old gets. It's the Greek gods, yeah, rah, 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 um, mm -hmm. cheering them on because they're just so cool. Um, but yeah, Ronnie ha has a book. And then, yeah, I'll probably, I'll, 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 since since the path is opening that way, I'll I'll take the path, you know, yeah. see see what that happens. What happen. yeah. Nobody was more surprised than I when um, this book sold. I, I, that, that did, um, surprise me. Let's just put it that way. It was not the intention to, um, put a book out and, and sell it in the traditional manner. Um, yeah, yeah. I just, I wrote down the story. Um, the important thing was to write down the story. Um, and it just started having a little life of its own. And I thought, well, I have to let go of the bicycle and, and, and let it see what it does. You well, know, once you do the creative, once you do the creative work, it's now something else. It's its own own entity, and you you have yeah, to let yeah. it go. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely right. Non attached. You you know that as a musician, don't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it was one of the big surprises of twenty twenty one for me, and that's why we open the year twenty twenty two on the Hermes podcast with you. Tamra. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so now really very last question. Um, I don't know. Of course, often book titles are not chosen by the, by the writers themselves. But <laughs> can you just explain why it's called Making the Ordinary Extraordinary? Oh, you got me. It was not going to be called that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it was not going to look like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was, I, I deferred to my publisher because, um, I was going to call the book Cassandra. Um, <laughs> and I thought it was going to be a very quiet, um, I was thinking maybe gray <laughs> with white print. <laughs> Yeah, so it's all the country, even even for in traditions, it's very shiny as a, as a cover, isn't it? Do you know what I when I first saw the cover, um, I, I I said to Ronnie, I said, you know, I don't want to sound like a '60s hippie, but does that look like live at the Fillmore West Manly P Hall with DJ <laughs> Buddha opening Act Lucid Nation? And he was like, you know. I think you're right. <laughs> and I thought, oh, if we only had that graphics department when we were a band doing the punk shows, this would have been great. <laughs> yeah, it, it's going to be all of it. You know, it got Buddha, it got Merkaba, it got the all seeing eye, it got everything, right? It is loud. <laughs> it is loud, it certainly is. But the book is not loud at all. It's exactly the, the exactly the right temperature and the right sound. This I may say as much. Tamra it was great to have you on the show. Thank okay. you so much. Um, wish oh, you all very the nice best. Talking to you. Wish you all the best for twenty twenty two. 
may the year be a bit better for everyone that lost who were oh yes definitely mm. but the pandemic brought us that book as you said earlier so at least some small good things come out of it oh i hope there's there's millions of artists right now doing their beautiful art and we'll be yeah. able to share it soon definitely definitely well thank you so much um have a good uh, time and uh, it was lovely to talk to you thank you tamra thank you Lucid Nation, sung by Tamra Lucid, who was my interview guest here today on the Thought Hermes podcast in this episode number 18. And uh, I really enjoyed to do that episode. So um, thank you for listening. It was great to have you. Once again, we have you back here in the new year. And I hope you will follow us also throughout the coming 12 months and beyond, of course. Well, this year in April, actually, it will be our fifth anniversary already. Isn't that amazing? Five years. And we are well beyond 100 episodes now already. So lots of things to come yet. Um, um, looking forward to all that I prepare for you. And uh, yes, well, next week, what's up next week? You want to know, I'm sure. Well, next week, my guest will be um, Mathieu Ravignard. Mathieu Ravignard, who is from Canada from the Ottawa area and um, he has uh, over the last couple of years written a few books on 
mainly two topics, and that's are the topics that we are going to talk about. On the one hand, it is the rituals of Egyptian Freemasonry, Memphis, Misraim. But those of you who know a bit about Masonry will also know that it's not purely Masonic at all as a subject. It's about Egypt and it's mostly about occult rites, basically. And the other main topic, I'm sure there will be many more, um, re regards the French Gnostic Church, um, an offspring of the Catholic Church with a lot of occult background. Well, I might not be precise enough here, but this is not the episode which I talk about. So next week, Mathieu Ravigna will be telling us all about this in detail, and we'll ask him, I hope, interesting questions to not only clarify some definitions, but to get in-depth into the French Gnostic Church and the Memphis Misraim Rite, which you partly, partly maybe can even link historically. Right, so um, this was it. Episodes, episode is over and this was episode 18 of season 7 of the Thos Hermes podcast. See you next week in episode 19 and until then, have a good week. Be careful. Don't uh, don't get too close to too many people if you can avoid. Sounds terrible to say that, I know. But I think we are going through some kind of important moment to finally have a victory on that, on that virus that we need so much. Okay, so, and for this week, keep in mind... Take care, stay tuned, hear you soon.